a lot of the habits you establish truly dictate where you're going to be down the road. So like early on, it's, it's kind of easy to fool yourself. <laughs> you know, early on, like, oh no, I'm doing the right things. I'm in, I'm investing in these, like, you know, these shiny objects, these things that look super cool. All this stuff looks nice. And you feel like you're kind of making a little progress, but like, if you're not truly like being real with yourself and like, okay, like, am I really, you know, putting away for the future? Like, do I really like care about like legacy? And what am I doing about that? Like, do I really care about like, you know, making sure that, um, you know, I'm playing defense and I'm protecting my wealth. Like, what are you actually doing to uh, implement those things? Welcome to the Share the Wealth Show, where minority professionals can learn to escape the racial wealth gap and catapult themselves into abundance. Your host, Nicole Pendergrass, grew her net worth from being negative to multiple six figures. Join her on her investigative mission to expose secret strategies of the wealthy so we can all have the tools needed to build the life and legacy we were created to possess. Now it's time for the show. Hey, 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 Wealthpreneur. Welcome back to another episode of the Share the Wealth Show. This is the show where we discuss strategies on how to build, grow, and protect minority wealth. And today we have with us Mr. Kofi Thompson. Guys, you just don't know what you're in for today. This gentleman is a powerhouse. He's really affecting and changing lives. He's had a childhood, I feel like, a lot of people could probably relate to and to see him turn that around into the business that he owns now. He's a financial advisor and the founder of Zion Capital Management, right? It's capital management. Correct. Okay. <laughs> and I just already know from the stories he's told, as I've heard him speak at conferences before and is is just so impactful and you know his heart is in the right place he really wants to affect lives through building wealth so Kofi, he works he used to work at first gen do you still work at first gen or are you you're fully into your zion zion uh, capital fully into now? zion i was at um northwestern mutual but fully at zion okay now yeah Okay, perfect. Well, as a comprehensive financial advisor, he helps his clients build, manage, and protect. This is almost um, build, invest, grow. This looks like kind of the same. Um, <laughs> and transition wealth along to them, uh, allowing them to follow a defined path and turn their dreams into their realities. Um, growing up, Kofi was impacted by many financial traumas that his parents faced while growing up in Section 8 housing. And in his early 20s, reality struck. And after his father passed away from cancer and he came to the conclusion that no one should pass off debt instead of wealth. After this and realizing much uh, financial pain that people had were caused by misinformation and miseducation, it became his mission to serve and heal the financial lives of others. I love that. So you. can you expound a little bit on, firstly, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And can you come expand a little bit on that earlier part of your story where you went through all those those issues that got you to the point that you are today and what decisions what was that first step you made to change your financial life yeah absolutely so growing up uh in my household um it I we really didn't have many options. Um, we really didn't, you know, have any type of financial knowledge. There was no type of guidance. It was just one of those things that, like, my we I knew that we didn't have money. <laughs> we never really talked about it that much. Um, but just because of the things we did, we never really like took like awesome vacations. You know, I could remember going to like you know the all you can eat you know restaurants. My mom would be bringing in plastic, you know, plastic Ziploc bags. <laughs> You know, putting stuff in there to, you know, to take home. <laughs> um, you know, all the handy down clothes, watering down the detergent. So, like, we like really lived in the more of a, so of a scarcity kind of environment, always just kind of stretching. You know, every dollar we could. Um, and this was just life. Like, we I didn't really know any better. I just thought this was how things were. So, you know, as I continued to get older, and you start to realize, um, like a little bit more about your financial or socioeconomic status you just like compare yourselves to like your peer groups all the different things um and you're just like I you know started to realize like wow like I know we don't really have money I feel like when you don't grow up with a lot you desire to have more 
you know, in the future, like you desire to be able to like, I want to be able to, you know, travel, I want to be able to do these things. So at first, just kind of start off as like, you know, I just want to be able to experience life more. I want to be able to actually, you know, do the things, take those vacations. You see people on TV doing all this cool stuff. And you're like, man, like that looks awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, as I, you know, got out of high school and got into my early twenties, it reality actually really struck for me because um, when I, my parents unfortunately started getting sicker, um, my dad unfortunately got diagnosed with esophageal cancer and my mother had mental problems and she needed help. And I really started to see the impact of like what not having your financial situation in the right place can really do. Um, and it really like, we weren't able to provide the proper healthcare to them. Like we weren't able to get the best doctors. They really, you know, I saw them suffer immensely just because like, we didn't have the resources to truly provide for them. Um, and that's when it like really just kind of, uh, I had a 360 change in my mindset. Cause before it was like, Hey, like you want to, I, I want to, you know, become or gain financial, uh, freedom and financial stability to be able to live life. But then it was like, I want to be able to help people out and make sure that like my, no one has to go through these things or experiences that my parents had to live through, like seeing them suffer. And I personally think that like, you know, it's one thing like being able to, you know, live life in abundance, being able to you know, provide for yourself, but just being able to take care of the basic necessities. And like, you know, those things are so important. And like, I believe that, you know, one thing that kind of, I guess, really struck for me was like, I want to be in a position where anyone that I truly care about, like, doesn't have to worry about finances. Like, I want to be in a position where I can go to a, you know, a country and um, pay for someone's $40,000 surgery or, 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 you know, just, you know, start a foundation or start a school about financial education. Like, those things, those actually have an impact on people in my community really started to, you know, strike for me. So, yeah, that was really the uh, experience that really turned my mindset into starting to pay more attention to my financial health um, in my early 20s. Oh, my God. And you know what? We have a lot in common with our stories. Mm. Um, growing up financially disadvantaged, but not really realizing it as a child, because yeah. at the time, my parents did a really good job at Still letting us live full lives, even though we couldn't spend money on certain things, mm -hmm. even though we went to pay less for shoes, even though like, you know, we never saw movies the same day that they went out, they came out, like you had to wait six months to get to get the, go to the $2 movie theater that was down <laughs> yeah. the road. Like I ain't getting the hand. I mean, I was probably the only one who didn't have hand-me-downs because I was the oldest and I'm the only girl. Mm -hmm. But all my brothers, you know, hand me downs and all that. And like when you grow up in a suburb and you have a house with a yard, to some people that just is like, oh, you're rich because you have a house with a yard. But that wasn't our story, you know. Like mm -hmm. I, I think I told the other day of someone, I got so much trouble as a teenager for buying like a twenty dollars shirt that was on sale with my employee discount at a store that I worked at. I got in so much trouble because twenty dollars was way too much money for a shirt right? Like oh, it was, wow. yeah. 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 So it was one of those kind of things. So nowadays when my mom buys like a sweater, that's $30, I look at her, I'm like, are you crazy? What is happening? <laughs> Cause I still have those, still have those like internal limiting mm -hmm. beliefs about like just those money habits that I fight against all the time. And I'm still unearthing because that's a process. But yeah. also what I wanted to say is that um, then our dad's passing. So my dad passing was also the pivotal moment for me wanting to change my life and find another way to gain that financial freedom and that wealth and to retire my mom. So she wouldn't have to work two or three jobs and, you know, just make sure that we had money and not mm. money just for money's sake, but be able to like live how we want it. And it was mainly, uh, mainly for me to retire my mom because while my dad was, you know, on disability for a lot of years, she was working two to three jobs. And that was one of the things I was already looking for something to do. I want to do something that I loved because I heard so many times people going into careers and professions that they didn't like. And mm -hmm. I didn't want that to be my future. So I didn't know mm -hmm. what that was until the year that my dad passed is when I got introduced to real estate. And from there, I saw that as my vehicle mm. to retire my mom and to then it turned into helping other people gain financial freedom through real estate as well, which is 
why we're here today, right? So yes. we both have that same kind of mission spurred by that same kind of tragedy in our lives, um, same backgrounds. So now I'm super excited because you get to affect more than one person at a time, yeah, <laughs> like having absolutely. one-on-one conversations, which is, <laughs> is necessary because everybody's financial situation is different, but at least anybody listening, all the wealthpreneurs listening now, um, can get a lot of gems and insight from what you can share. Looking to build wealth with real estate? Are you all tapped out on YouTube University and ready to get help tailored to your specific situation and goals? Have you always known that you are a little different from the crowd, that you never liked following the status quo, and that you're just tired of living in mediocrity? You want to build wealth on your own terms outside of Wall Street? Well, you know, then maybe the Microfamily Mavericks mentorship program can help with that. It's a community where I handhold you through the process of buying your first small commercial multifamily building because not everyone is ready for 100 units out the gate. Why multifamily? Because it gives your rental income a hedge against vacancy. Imagine what happens when your single family rental tenant leaves, right? And why commercial five plus units? Because you have much more control over increasing the building's value in the commercial space and then in turn, increasing your own net worth. Starting small is a stepping stone to so much more because then you can tap that equity and buy another building and another and another and you get the point. So increasing your cash flow and your ability to be job optional along the way. It's all a part of the journey. So. If you think big, but you want to start small, and if you know multifamily real estate is the way for you to open the door to building a life of freedom, abundance, and legacy, but you just need someone to guide you step by step, and you want to be surrounded by other people on the same journey, doing the same thing, then just click the link in the show notes to find out a little bit more about the Microfamily Mavericks, and I look forward to potentially seeing you on the inside. So now back to the show. So I guess the first question really is then, what is something that you've seen over time with, you know, a lot of your clients, what's like a common underlying theme with either doing something with their finances, maybe like not in an optimal manner or some other things that you've suggested repeatedly to clients to implement first, like it's a good foundational piece. Mm, Okay. Um, so I, one thing that I often see that I often like in the beginning of our relationship, because usually in the beginning of relationship, there's a lot of, you know, changing of habits. There's a lot of, you know, really a lot are a lot of like planning, you know, changing a lot of different strategies, things along those lines. Um, What I often see though, from people that I work with initially is oftentimes a misalignment of their goals and their actions. Mm. So, and this is really one of the most common things uh, financially, and not with everyone. Uh, it's just like, you know, I relate to fitness because I'm a huge, you know, I, I believe health is the first wealth, but like, it's like you, you want the Instagram body, but then you're sitting on the couch eating Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then you go like, you. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh my God, I desire this, but then I'm doing this. And, and, and. Like I, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone like what actions they should or should not take, but there should be alignment as to what you're doing and what you truly desire at the end of the day. And it's like one of the most difficult things for a lot of people is like, and it's real, uh, it's really difficult because like finances are very like it's long term, right? You you may not necessarily like there's like I don't believe in get rich quick schemes. I don't believe in like you know just kind of you know um. Uh, overnight, you know, millionaires, things like that. Like a lot of the habits you establish truly dictate where you're going to be down the road. So like early on, it's it's kind of easy to fool yourself, <laughs> you know, early on, like, oh no, I'm doing the right things. I, I'm, in, I'm investing in these, like, you know, these shiny objects, these things that look super cool. All this stuff looks nice. And you feel like you're kind of making a little progress, but like, if you're not truly like being real with yourself and like, okay, like, am I really, you know, putting away for the future? Like, do I really like care about like legacy? And what am I doing about that? Like, do I really care about like, you know, making sure that, um, you know, I'm playing defense and I'm protecting my wealth. Like, what are you actually doing to uh, implement those things? And if like, it's really, it's difficult again, 
you know, because we have to be real for ourselves. We have to be like really looking deep, you know, go through some introspection, sometimes have a hard conversation with ourselves, but really like actually making sure that those actions are aligned down the road are so important. Like if you're going out, you know, every single weekend, taking vacations, you know, getting, you know, a car that's, you know, 30% of your income, you know, all these different things, like you're not on a track to build wealth. That's, that's the reality of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you yeah. chasing a higher income is not going to help that because you're just going to continue to spend more and more of what you're taking in. Like you got to be building, you got to be setting away, sowing seeds for the future. And if mm. you're not doing that, you gotta, you gotta give yourself a reality check and be like, Hey, like either I don't want this which is perfectly fine. Maybe you don't want to, you know, build the wealth. Maybe you don't want the legacy. That's perfectly mm-hmm. fine. But like really being truthful with yourself about, okay, let me pay attention to the actions that I'm taking. Are they in line with the future goals that I have? Um, and then the second part, second question that she heard, or the second part of that question, <laughs> what was that again? Um, um, so I got, I don't even remember what the second part yeah, yeah. of the question. I, I thought I, when you said second part of the question, I was like, there was a second part. To yeah, the I'm, I'm full of attention to that. I just oh. tend to ask questions okay. very word wordily. Foundational piece. Okay. Foundational. Yes. Piece? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. See, you're good. You're so, yeah, good. Found, the foundational piece for building wealth. So um, <laughs> when it comes to, you know, building wealth, like there's, there's a couple of different aspects you want to have. Like, one is like you want to have like before you like start going out there and playing like you know full offensive you know going out investing in properties doing all those things like you want to make sure you have like your defensive pieces in place like you shouldn't be looking for a real estate deal if you don't have an emergency fund (laughs) like that's that's the reality of it (laughs) like okay I have to I have to jump in because you just exposed my whole world. I definitely did that. I, I had I was scraping together that down payment for my first property. I had no emergency fund. I don't even know how I came up with the down payment. I piecemealed it together. Yeah. So um I maybe am a little bit more risk risk tolerant mm-hmm. than what's probably safe you know, like reasonably yeah. saving, like what you should do, but okay. So now let's go into what, how, what I, and I know what you're going to say because you know, your financial advisor, you want people to protect the money, but mm-hmm. I know there's a difference between protecting and growing and you can't, Absolutely. I don't think you can be in growth phase if you are so cautious about protecting the money, because in protecting, you won't grow it. A little bit of risk is involved. So how do you play off the trying to grow, but not take as much risk? Like, what what do you think about that? Yeah, great question. So it's, I believe in like the power of the and, not the tyranny of the or. Okay, say that again, slow. I I believe in the power of the and, not the tyranny of the or. So like, you have to do this or that, but you can do them both at the same time, but like make sure you're being intentional. So for example, say I'm getting together with someone um, and they're like starting from scratch. We're completely starting mm-hmm. from scratch. I'm gonna be like, mm-hmm. hey, like we're gonna create this strategy for you. We're gonna have some of your money going towards your emergency fund. We're gonna have some of your money going towards your investments. We're gonna have some of your money, you know, going towards, you know, this future goal that you have. We're gonna have some money going towards, you know, protection, insurance pieces, things like that. And so we're like really creating this like, uh, strategy to say, hey, how can we like chip away at all of these different goals at the same time? Because mm. don't want to be like all offense or all defense. Like, there's no team that has won with like an amazing offensive, <laughs> you know, strategy, but no defense. No defense. <laughs> and I'm not gonna say okay. like you could do it, but like you, yeah. I, like in building wealth, like I'm. There are outliers out there. There are absolutely outliers. There are people that have done it, like you know doing like all offense, but like you really want to also reduce risk and risks are also very apparent. And like, if you're, I believe like, don't pay attention to the risk. Like don't focus on that. Like you don't want to focus. Oh my God, this bad thing's going to happen. I'm like, you know, get in that negative mindset and you're just focusing all on yeah. the bad. Um, but like, you don't want to drive a hundred miles down this, the, the highway without a seatbelt. Like you, you got to 
be okay. you know okay. Cool. Like, you know uh, okay got it aware of those risks no, no well taken yeah <laughs> and you may get you may get to point b perfectly fine but like if you hit one speed bump it's over okay yes so i the whole going down the highway 100 miles an hour with no seatbelt on i don't quite hit 100 but sometimes i'm at 80 it's like yeah. my cruise point so i get and that's actual oh gosh i hope no cops are listening to this but you have to catch me in the action oh okay i'm putting way too much out there anyway <laughs> In life, I feel like I do that too. Like in my investments, like I do, I am a little bit more risk tolerant, like I said, but I still try to take calculated risks Mm -hmm. and not just jump off the deep end. So I will go 80 with the seatbelt. I'll be shy of a hundred because I don't want the car to flip kind of thing, you know, like just what I don't want everything to kind of blow up. So I think that is a great point. And it just depends on someone's risk tolerance. Um, it's in the spreading of the buckets to build all these different avenues at the same time and mm-hmm. kind of like hedge, hedge your bets against, you know, total loss and like build as you're growing. Um, is there a standard percentage that, you know, your, your income should be in each of these buckets or does it really depend on the person? What's like a safe standard? Yeah, <laughs> there, there's a standard um, and it, so the the most appropriate answer it does depend on the individual person because there's a lot of variation as to like you know what someone's overall financial freedom ages you know mm-hmm. what types of other you know goals they have there's a lot of variation but if I were generally the percentage I usually uh, <clears throat> tell people is a twenty sixty twenty approach so and this is like for the average person that they start saving in like their twenties. They want to retire, you know, by like their 60s. This is just like average. Um, Mm -hmm. 60% of your money should be allocated towards your fixed expenses. Um, Usually your house is taking up, you know, um, your house shouldn't really be more than like 30%. (laughs) You know, the other 30% other types of like necessary fixed expenses. 20% should be going, you know, towards the audience living their best life. You know, you should also have, you know, money out there to, you know, live life, travel, do all those things. And then 20% should be allocated towards the future. Mm. Now that's definitely going to make me go back and look at my allocations because Mm -hmm. I can't say that I have sat and purposefully said, oh, this much money I'm going to put toward, you know, future endeavors, this much I'm going to use for today this much I'm going to use for like living. I kind Mm -hmm. of just, it's, I'll be completely transparent. It's super haphazard. It's like, oh, we want to go on a vacation. Okay. Let's just make a budget, but that budget is not based off of our income and like allocation of percentages. It's kind of like, okay, well, we'll, we'll pay for it and figure it out. Right. And I think that is a problem with getting to the level where you're not living paycheck to paycheck because you have discretionary income. Yeah, absolutely. and it's easier to kind of play around with that. Yeah, and the, the one of the reasons why it's you know very uh, like in order to continue to like level up, continue to go in uh, the right trajectory, it's important to really be intentional about those allocations. Is because of Parkinson's okay. law. So, okay. if you guys aren't familiar with Parkinson's law, Parkinson's law is essentially that like anything that's available is going to be consumed. Like if we like go to like a restaurant and all you can eat place and we put a bunch of food on our plate, like it doesn't matter like how hungry we were, like we're going to try to eat every single (laughs) thing that's on that plate. (laughs) Oh my God. So Parkinson's law. Yeah. Very, very true. Go, go finish. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah. So like, you know, the reality is, is like, like what we got to do is get a smaller plate. Like if we really want to control our portions, get a smaller plate. <laughs> so making that bucket smaller because it's just human nature. Like we, that's what we do. It's it's nothing. It like it. It's not as much about discipline. It's just the fact that we are going to consume. You know what's available in that regard. So like we got to allocate specific amounts so we know. All right, this is the amount of consumption I'm going to have here. 
you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to separate portion sizes. Like I'm going to do smaller plates, you know, so on and so forth. Like, you know, any, you know, business that's operating they're saying, Hey, like this is the percentage that's going towards marketing. This is the percentage that's going towards, you know, employee benefits. This is the percentage that's going towards uh, research and development. Like they're allocating these specific things because they know that, Hey, like we just have this big pool of money. <laughs> it is just going to get consumed at whatever is urgent in the time, in the time, in the time. Is, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's ashamedly how I operate with finances sometimes. <laughs> um, so I will say that this is, uh, well, so a couple of things, but the first thing is, this is why I think the suggestion of automatically creating automations in your finances, like having uh, mm -hmm. a bank account or automatic payments or like a certain percentage or dollar amount um, going to a separate account that's, you know, harder to access that mm -hmm. maybe has, you know, a two, three, four day transfer time so that you can't use it for a on the whim purchase, right? Or it's a bank account that you don't see all the time or is, doesn't have a physical branch near you, you know, and transfer times take a long time. Because if you start siphoning money for specific things into that area, then it can build for a while undisturbed. And then you can use it. You can use that bucket for what it was intended for at the at Absolutely. That point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's it exactly how I do my finances now, like with bill pay, um, not really with like saving and putting stuff into my future buckets and all those other things. So I need to reallocate my automatic distributions into these other accounts so that I can stay, you know, on path to having these kind of buckets, like as you suggested, because I really love that 20, 60, 20 idea and all, mm -hmm. you know, you can tweak it a little bit for what you need in your specific situation, but I think I'll do that. But the one other thing I did want to say about Parkinson's law for all my ladies out there, that's why no matter what size purse you have, it will <laughs> always get filled and stuffed to capacity. Yes. Oh yeah. I I like I went from having a big tote bag because my shoulder, I started getting shoulder pains, to like a small crossbody. The other day I was trying to get into the apartment building and I could not find my keys. And I have a small crossbody that's like the size of an envelope. I'm oh. like, there's nothing. Why is there so much stuff in this little purse? I can't even find these big yeah. chunky keys because I have so much stuff in there. And I was just oh. like, this is, I'm defeating the whole purpose. So yes, Parkinson's law is <laughs> true. It's a real thing. And mm -hmm. thank you for uh, highlighting that for us. <laughs> absolutely absolutely are you enjoying this episode then stop what you're doing right now head over to apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review it really helps our show get pushed to more people who are looking for the information that we're sharing here we have to share the wealth if you listen to us on youtube make sure you like the episode that you're listening to right now and subscribe to our channel. Then share the channel with somebody else. There are people out there looking for the information you're listening to right now. So make sure you share it with someone who you know needs it. Now back to the show. You know, it, it the systems are really what, you know, leads to success. Like, you know, as you mentioned, like, you know, having, you know, a set it and forget it mentality. Like you'll find like the biggest places where like there's like an enormous amount of wealth whether you look at like, you know, houses, you know, it could be, uh, you know, 401ks, it could be like, you know, whole life insurance, it could be uh, social security, you know, um, all those different things like are automatic. Mm -hmm. They're just automatically being, you know, set up, they're automatically being drawn. You, once you, you know, purchase your house, you're paying your mortgage every single month. You know, these things are usually the biggest places where there's just a massive amount of, you know, wealth and money because they're, set up in their system of, you know, paying those things c consistently. Um, and like when it comes to like, you know, building wealth long-term, so much of it is just consistency in what you're doing. Like just doing something like they, they often say like, you know, success is like doing the things uh, that, you know, um, other people, you know, won't do or doing like the simple things like, mm -hmm. you know, consistently enough and for a long time. And if you just like, for example, you want to, you know, be a real estate investor in, in five years, you know, set your fund up and then allocate a percentage of that, you know, four or 5%, you know, an amount that's, you know, you know, reasonable and then just set it and forget that. 
And then next thing you know, you're going to look down, you know, five years from now and be like, wow, like I have enough to invest in my first property. <laughs> yes. I love that. That's a great idea. It's just like, it's automating the systems that will help you build wealth mm -hmm. because we are all human. And no, and no matter how much we try to, for most people, you know, stay on top of being consistent with certain things, sometimes where you can get decision-making uh, like capacity or getting some decision out of your head and into an automation, the better you are able to focus on the other things. Because I know, and I don't know what the exact name or law of this is, but there is like a certain amount of decisions that we as humans can make in any given day. And so mm -hmm. we start the day with a certain amount that we can make. And every decision that we have to make throughout the day kind of decreases our ability to make effective decisions, you know, mm -hmm. later on in the day. So that's why, you know, like Steve's jobs used to always wear black because that yeah. was one less decision that he had to make in the day. So automating those kind of things. I actually tried that at one point in the winter, I bought just like a pack of black socks because I was like, I'm spending way too much time trying to find socks that match my outfit. Cause I'm trying to be cute with like little pattern socks and, <laughs> you know, match up things. And I was like, you know what, let me just cut that out for a second. Let me just get the all black socks. And I did it. And honestly, like in that time, because getting ready in the morning, the socks was like the last thing that was like always making me late. <laughs> like I'd pick out a pair of socks and then be a hole in one, or I couldn't find the other matching one and all this other stuff. I'm like, I can't, I got to cut this out. And that actually, it, I could feel the relief in the morning, like not having that decision, just grabbing the black mm -hmm. socks and putting them on. I could feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think automating just even simple things like that in your life can help with, you know, more complicated or making bigger decisions later on that will help move your financial, not that socks are anything to do with your financial journey, but as a, a um, kind of example. Um, but I think that that's, yeah, I think automating is, is great. So besides like automating bank accounts, I know you can automate some like investments. What other investments have you seen um, clients who maybe want to build up a capital to invest in real estate? Like, cause I know you, you are not a real, you are a real estate proponent as well, right? Like you're a real estate advocate. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm a wealth advocate. So anything that has to do with wealth, wealth. advocate. So anything. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Love that. Okay. So if like somebody was coming and they, like you said, you're saving up, let's say you're, you're putting a certain amount into a bucket to save eventually for your first real estate purchase. Besides just putting it in your savings account, because we know at least I, and I think you would agree that's kind of a losing battle with inflation and the rate of at yeah, least right now absolutely. what you're getting with savings. So where can you put capital to save it up? That would be um, kind of like get you a little bit better return than savings, but still be safe and liquid. And I don't know if that kind of product exists. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, when it comes to like, you know, building up the capital to be able to do something like one, I want to like absolutely disclose that like, hey, if you're going to like, you know, start investing or like looking at like securities or, you know, various types of investments, like you don't want to just go out there and just do it without any knowledge without like a, a the guide of a professional you don't want to just you know because you can <laughs> you know make some yes. mistakes it's definitely yes. uh, definitely the reality there so you want to be intentional either you know learn the right things that you need to learn on your own or work with a professional that's going to guide you um in what you need to do but it's pretty easy uh for example like I always you know tell my client says hey like if you have a goal or something that you want to do um, and it's like two, three years away. Um, great place to have that in is like actually just like investing it in like a fixed income, you know, portfolio or like a index fund, you know, put that okay. in something that's going to, you know, be diversified heavily. So you're minimizing your risk, um, mm -hmm. putting it somewhere that's, you know, in the market has various types of securities in there. Um, and time horizon is like the biggest component of this um, because you want to make sure that you have the time you know, two, three mm. years at least to, you know, that money may fluctuate a bit, but if you have the time horizon on average and you're in a diversified fund, um, you will have more than you would if you just had that in the savings account, you know, on okay. average. So it's 
like really it's about like time or allocating your funds in an account based off your time horizon. But if you do that okay. properly, um, like it's something that like when I dive deep with a client, like I'm understanding what their goals are and I'm doing this, you know, things for them. If you do that properly, you can, it's a much more efficient place than having your money just sitting in the same account. Like, frankly, like I would say that like, if you have a goal that's less than two years, the savings account is a great place because it's highly liquid, it's safe. But if it's more than two years, like you're just, you know, losing money to inflation. <laughs> yeah. You know, what about um, like um, bonds or money market accounts or things like yeah. that, that uh, are potentially, at least from my understanding, could be higher than a savings account? Is that right? Or is that mistaken? No, no, yeah. So money market funds are generally going to be higher than the savings account. Um, bonds are going to be as well too. So bonds that would fit into the category of like a fixed income index fund. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, because bond is a uh, fixed income security. Okay, and so what about your like emergency account? If you're setting up mm -hmm. your emergency account, should that just be in a savings account, or can your emergency account potentially be growing as an, an investment, but a liquid event an investment that you could get to yeah. if you needed to? Yeah. So uh, the answer is like it depends, and I know that's not the, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not the answer that everyone wants to hear, but it, it all depends because a lot of like, and I, I see finances like like medicine or like you know health or diet. Like, there's no one size shoe fits all approach and I know that's like what we really want we want just yeah. like that one like what do I need to do <laughs> well it depends on what who you are what your goals are what your circumstances are so that comes down to like just risk tolerance of the individual mm -hmm. um, and also like like again like looking at like what your capital needs are in the short term as well too like um, if someone is like has a very, very conservative. They're super, you know, low risk. They don't want to take, you know, any exorbitant risk. Um, yeah, like money market accounts, things like that, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe even like a CD, uh, savings accounts, all those different pieces. Um, because you ideally, you know, don't want to like part of the finances is like the emotional part. You don't want to be losing sleep. <laughs> you know, over your money being all stressed out. But if someone's a little bit more risk tolerant, they have a high risk profile and they don't have any other cap short-term capital needs. And they also have like liquidity in other places if they really need to access it. Yeah, you can be a little bit more aggressive. You can maybe put that uh, emergency fund in like a fixed income portfolio, maybe like a balanced portfolio, maybe even, you know, get a little bit more risky in that, but like I would steer away from being too risky because the reality is that we just, we don't, we can never predict life. And that's why like, it's, it's so important to really, you know, not take general advice, like understand like what you truly need from a financial standpoint, um, because you can't predict, you know, life. And as soon as, you know, the, you need that money for uh, repairing your roof and your investment property, uh, is the same time that the market goes down <laughs> and you know it, yes. it's like you know it, it's just like it it can create a not great scenario so like you know really understanding okay like what is how much safe money do I need you know mm -hmm. every company out there has reserves um, they have that money in reserves for the liquidity for those events and then once you have that like you know typically I recommend like at least three to six months um, if you're just looking on the personal side um, and you're like, you know, working uh, at an employer, getting a consistent income, um, at least three to six months, what do I need on the safe short-term side? And then anything you don't need above that short-term side, should ideally be invested? Should ideally be getting better returns? Okay, guys, don't kill me, but I'm going to have to cut this episode short. This is too juicy and we need to do this in a part two. So stay tuned for the next episode that airs and you can hear the rest of our conversation. Did you love this episode of Share the Wealth Show? Be sure to connect with Nicole by following her on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. If you picked up any of the gems that were dropped by today's guest, make sure you not only put them in your bag, but if you know of someone who would benefit from this information, don't keep it to yourself. Share the wealth and make sure to leave us a rating and review. We'll see you for next week's episode.
Subscribe so you'll be notified. 